The A750 is a card that I've been chronicling on this channel for the past year or so now. And despite some initial weird performance and graphical glitches, a lot has improved on this card and architecture in general, making it worth considering as a budget alternative to the red and green teams. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something that I missed. I can't cover every aspect of the A750 over the course of a single video, but I figured showing some benchmarks and comparisons when they're relevant during discussions is the best way to help explain what I'll be talking about. Without any further ado, let's dive into the A750 and see how this relatively inexpensive card fares. To cut to the chase when it comes to my biases and overall experience with the Alchemist lineup, I've only used the cards on PCIe Gen 4 capable Intel and AMD systems. This may have a lot to do with my opinions on how stable it is in the context of the entire system, and also will probably skew the performance of the card more positively since the platforms are more recent and have been validated. Initially when I got the card, I used it with an i7-11700K, which while still an awesome chip, also supports all the necessary requirements that Intel has been pretty transparent with conveying to consumers. Later I upgraded to an i5-13600K, which is a PCIe 5 capable chip. And although this card maxes out at PCIe Gen 4, it still works on PCIe Gens other than 4.0. In my experience though, you need to pay attention to your motherboard and CPU choice as picking a mismatch or inadequate part may lead to a poor user experience. First off, you'll need resizable bar or smart access memory support on your motherboard, particularly in the BIOS. Contrary to popular belief, this technology has actually been built into the PCIe standard since something like Gen 2, making most systems by default able to accommodate this feature. Where things get screwy though is PCIe switching on their motherboard and CPU side of things. Support for these PCIe DMA features on the motherboard side of things didn't really start to become prevalent until about 2018 or 2019 depending on the manufacturer. As a result, you'll probably want to stick to at least an 11th gen Intel chip or a 3rd gen AMD Ryzen chip, as they are the first chips to support the new feature over PCIe 4. I mean, rebar on PCIe Gen 3 would technically work, but I'm way more comfortable recommending this card to users already making use of PCIe Gen 4 in their systems as it implies automatic compatibility with this feature, and also a couple of others. The overall transfer rates of a PCIe Gen 3 system are also going to be lower by default than a Gen 4 capable one. When it comes to raw bandwidth, 8 Gen 4 lanes are equivalent in bandwidth to 16 Gen 3 lanes, so you're literally cutting the data pipe to the rest of your system in half. At the end of the day, this is still 16 gigabytes per second of bidirectional data flow to and from the GPU in a worst case scenario. But some pewter nerds may also see this and want a PCI Gen 4 capable system as a result. Additionally, I generally recommend you pair this card with an Intel chip if you're looking for an easy plug and play experience. Like I mentioned before, these chips are validated to work with the Intel GPU. And although they still work with AMD chips, I'm just not as familiar with the quirks and oddities of how this architecture handles the AM4 or AM5 platforms. As a result, I'm more comfortable recommending Alchemist cards to Intel-based users, as it's just more stable in my limited time with AMD platforms. My overall experience with installing this card is also that which was marked with relatively little frustration. Initially when I got my hands on the A750, the drivers installed normally, the card wasn't emitting ionizing radiation, and probably about 75% plus of games ran, at least without crashing the system. Now at this point in early 2024, the A750 plays literally all games I've tried on it, but there might be some graphical errors still in some games here and there. Black Ops Cold War just comes to mind because it still has this weird issue with the game just rendering splotches of color instead of the actual environment, but it's probably something that can be fixed given it didn't used to do this. I can't pinpoint an exact driver version where it started happening, but it wasn't an issue when I initially got my hands on the card, and I'm not sure what I may be able to do on my end to make it run properly. I literally can't think of other games that this happens in and even other games that I've previously brought up for having graphical errors have been fixed. Maybe it was a DirectX 11 translation error, or maybe something just wasn't being accessed properly. No matter what, it's been fixed, and you can now play the vast, vast majority of games on these cards, when I wouldn't have been comfortable saying that before. The overall architecture of the A750 is interesting when comparing to competing designs from NVIDIA and AMD. 
featuring the ZHPG microarchitecture. This fork of the Intel Gen 12 graphics architecture features more level 1 and 2 cache as well as additional high performance compute focused instructions not found in the ZLP fork. Terminology with ZHPG is also a little different from the low power variant. What used to be called execution units are now called Z vector engines, and the structure of the execution ports are a bit different with HPG. Where ZLP features only one execution port, with the port allowing for a simultaneous floating point and integer SIMD computation, or an extended math computation, which includes transcendental functions such as exponentials or logarithms. ZHPG allows for port 1 to execute on either an 8-wide SIMD single precision floating point data path, or an 8-wide SIMD integer path concurrently computing an extended math function. Port 2 in the Z vector engine is dedicated to the XMX core, which is Intel's tensor cores. These are 10 24-bit white matrix units used to apply operations on tiles of data as opposed to straight vectors like with AVX. You have to input additional parameters such as the distance between the start of each column, aka the stride, to ensure that the core is able to load store data properly. Comparing and contrasting the approaches to tensor processing between Intel and NVIDIA's architectures, and the NVIDIA cores are capable of, quote, smarter computations than Intel's, at least when comparing Intel and Ada to Alchemist. Where NVIDIA cards now have the ability to cut the zeros out of sparse matrices, saving tons of computational overhead since you aren't going through all these values as they're not really relevant besides knowing that they're there, Intel's XMX cores function more like an AVX 512 unit, where it performs accelerated loads, SIMD compute operations, and then accelerated stores. This is fundamentally how all computers operate, but what I'm trying to get at is that Intel's tensor cores are literally tensor cores in the same way that a standard GPU core is a vector core. It does operations on matrices, and that's it. One thing I will say though is that Intel's card has a higher ratio of specialized compute hardware to your stereotypical FP32 compute than NVIDIA and AMD. Where NVIDIA cards since Ampere feature an identical number of tensor cores and texture mapping units, this means you need to work your way up to the RTX 4090 if you want 448 or more tensor cores. Granted, the 4090 as a whole is a much stronger card than the A750, but with the A750 you get 448 tensor cores across 28 GPU cores as opposed to the 128 found on the 4090. Because of the performance tricks I mentioned earlier, the 184 NVIDIA tensor cores found in the RTX 4070 overall have higher data throughput than the 448 Intel XMX cores. But the fact that this much specialized compute is on a card that's this inexpensive is a nice inclusion if you plan to write software to take advantage of it. Looking at the cache structures, and the Gen 12.7 architecture as a whole is relatively well equipped to handle high performance 3D graphics computations and maintaining said high throughput. With 192 kilobytes of L1 data cache per Z vector engine, and an additional 64 kilobyte block of texture cache, each core in the card has a relatively large pool of Andai SRAM to keep itself fed. To put this cache system into perspective, Ampere and Ada feature 128 kilobytes of L1 data and 64 kilobytes of L1 texture cache per SM, with GPUs having between 24 and 128 SMs depending on the model. The A750 also features a 12 megabyte L2 cache that functions more like a traditional unified L3 cache in a CPU based on the research that I've done. This is pretty standard for an Intel chip to feature 12 megs of unified last level cache, and comparing to other newer cards on the market at this price point, it actually falls behind. The RTX 4060 features 24 megabytes of level 2 cache, and although that doesn't function as a unified pool like on this card, it does on the RX 6700 XT, which comes in with an enormous 96 megabytes of L3. I don't think the cache size is hindering the performance on the A750, especially considering the performance of the card isn't that far behind the A750 despite the cuts to the L2 cache. What is the cache in this card feeding? The short answer is a cutdown DG2512 GPU die manufactured on TSMC 6 nanometer. The long answer is 28 cores, each with 16 Z vector engines, equating to 448 total SIMD units capable of 3584 FP32 or N32 computations along with the additional 448 XMX cores. There's also 224 texture mapping units to keep saturated with data, and 112 rasterization operation pipelines that actually draw the geometry on screen. When it comes to parallel operations, this card has the capabilities to perform incredibly well in highly parallel workloads written to take advantage of all the hardware on board. And for the most part, I think that APIs like Vulkan, DirectX, and OpenGL do a pretty good job of parallelizing when possible. 
However, not all software does. It's just something to keep in mind as we move forward with the specifications. With 8GB of standard 16GB per second GDDR6, the card has ample room to store texture and model data if you're looking to game at 1080p. This is also across 8 memory controllers, while competing cards in this price range are stuck with either 4 or 6. This equates to 256 bits total, capable of 512GB per second of total bandwidth across all the controllers. This is actually superior to the RTX 4070 that I've got now, so the horsepower is there to perform large data transfers relatively quickly. Unfortunately, the end user can't adjust the memory clocks, but I'd be curious to see how faster GDDR6 or G6X would help performance. In terms of clock speed, the A750 is very similar, almost identical in fact, to the A770 that I've got. With a base clock of 2050 MHz and an out-of-the-box boost clock of 2.4 GHz, this card clocks relatively quickly when compared to older gen parts, and on par with current gen cards from both AMD and Nvidia. However, Intel's driver software allows you to adjust the clocks indirectly by pushing up the voltage frequency curve. This is overall pretty quick, and allows the card to hit 17.2 teraflops of FP32 compute power at stock, and well over 18.75 at the adjusted 2616 MHz overclock. The pixel and texture fill rates are also ridiculously high on the card at the stock clocks, with just under 269 gigapixels and 538 gigatexels per second of respective pixel and texture fill rate. This is honestly enough to comfortably render 4K scenes, but the ratio of this hardware to shading hardware is high enough to the point where the shaders might actually be bottlenecking the front end and not utilizing the texture mapping units to the fullest. I'm just guessing, but that's my initial impression after messing with the card and doing some 3D graphics work on them. Power draw for the A750 is also pretty standard for the RTX 30 series and RX 6000 series. With a base TDP of 225 watts, the card was capable of hitting up to 250 watts, but in reality it hung out at or significantly below the base TDP a majority of the time. This isn't as bad as a card like the 3080 which dumps out heat into your room, but at the same time it's not really all that efficient considering the level of performance on offer. We're looking at 3060-esque frame rates and a power envelope more similar to a 3070 or RX 6800 non-XT. If efficiency of your components is a big deal to you, then the Nvidia and AMD offerings at this price point would draw less power and perform better in games. The 4060 immediately comes to mind as the core literally draws 115 watts at most, but if power consumption isn't as much of a concern, then the A750 isn't necessarily a power hog, but it's nothing to write home about. To see how the A750 performs, let's throw it into my test system, a decently powerful PC that shouldn't provide any hurdles the A750 will have to overcome. To ensure the GPU is the limiting factor, I've got an i5-13600K clocked to 5.5GHz on the performance cores and a flat 4GHz on the efficiency cores. The six hyperthreaded performance cores in this chip will allow the card to be saturated with render data. To keep the CPU and GPU fed with said data, we've got 64 gigs of 3.6 gigabit per second DDR4, which while not as fast as lower end DDR5, will perform adequately for the purposes of this video, and won't bottleneck the CPU, especially when paired with an A750. Additional system test specs are in the description should you want to replicate these tests for yourself. Without any further ado, let's dive into the ARC A750, and see how this card performs in games.
So thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about the A750. Does it meet your performance expectations, or would you rather get something more powerful for a similar price? That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.